Well, thank, thank you very much, Ralph, and uh, thank you, Steve, and thank all of you for coming here, uh, Larry and others. And it is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm always up for uh, free food and uh, <laughs> free stuff and, uh, d d during these turbulent times. But as uh, Steve indicated, money is critical. And to say that, people will say, yeah, well, so what? But think about it. You can get it right on taxes. You can get it right on regulation. You can get it right on government spending. But if you don't get the money right, it's all for naught. Why? Because money facilitates transactions with each other, trading. If we don't trade with one another, do transactions with each other, we don't get a higher standard of living. We'd still be living in caves. Each of us as an individual can't do everything on our own. So if you want to bake a cake and sell a cake, you trade to get the ingredients, the eggs, the flour, the sugar, get the equipment, the ovens, the utensils, get a contract to get a truck to deliver the cake. All of these things require transactions. We do billions of them each day. Money facilitates those transactions. But if you don't get the money right, then you're not going to get the kind of transactions and investing you need, and we're not going to get a higher standard of living. We will stagnate. So it facilitates trade, but it does more than that. It promotes trust and cooperation. If money is good, we can deal with strangers. We don't have to do a background check. Give them the money, and we can do deals with one another. So it breaks down barriers between people. You may not love your neighbor, but you want to sell to your neighbor. So it does all the things that liberals say they like. Money makes it possible. So in that sense, money properly understood is the root of all good by breaking down barriers, enabling us to trade, enabling us to invest in the future. So if you don't have sound money, then all of that goes to naught. It has to have a standard of value. For example, we have 60 minutes in an hour. Now imagine what your life would be like if the Federal Reserve was in charge of clocks. <laughs> imagine if they floated the clock. 60 minutes an hour one day, 52 minutes the next, 26 the minutes, 80, 80 minutes after that, you'd have to have hedges driven as futures to figure out how many hours you're working. Let's say you're baking that cake. Just bake the batter 40 minutes, you have to figure out, is that nominal minutes? Inflation adjusted minutes? Is that a New York minute, a Bangladesh minute, a Canadian minute? It would be chaotic. So money measures value. Just as clocks measure time, scales measure weight, and rulers measure length. So money in and of itself isn't wealth, unless you have a rare coin, but it's a claim on products and services, like a coat check at a restaurant like this. It would be, uh, so the idea that if you print up a lot of money out of thin air, you create prosperity is like a restaurant saying, if we do a lot of coat checks, will stimulate the production of a lot of coats. No, it's a claim on products and services. So if you undermine the trust in money, which as Steve indicated, whether it's a token coin, a piece of paper, or a blip on a computer, you get less investing in the future. As you all know, investing is a risky undertaking. Maybe three years, five years, seven years with a drug, 10 years before you get a return. That's risky enough. But if you don't know whether you're going to get a hundred cent dollar, an eighty cent dollar, ten cent dollar, a dollar ten dollar, you get less investing. So when the trust in money is eroded, you get investing in the things that already exist. When anyone asks me, should I invest in gold? I know we have a problem. Why would you invest in gold unless you're a jeweler? The reason you do it is an insurance policy, because you can't trust the authorities. And so you saw it in the 70s. None of you are old enough to remember the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> it's called pandering. <laughs> I was in politics, but didn't do enough of it. So I'm here now <laughs> speaking with bank vaults, but in front of bank vaults. But, but in the 1970s, you saw the same thing. Oil suddenly seemed to go from $3 to almost $40 a barrel. 
Now prices, as we know, just don't tell you what something may cost. It also gives you information about what people want and don't want. But when you corrupt money, it's like putting a virus in a computer, it corrupts the information. So in the 70s when oil seemed to go up in price, what did that tell people? Oh, we must be running out of the stuff. And so we poured tens of billions, hundreds of billions into energy. Oh, we're running out of the stuff. Well, in the early 80s, after that terrible inflation was vanquished, by, led by Ronald Reagan, oil crashed from almost $40 a barrel down to 10, finally stabilized at 20 to $25 a barrel. Countless thousands of wildcatters wiped out. Major oil companies like Exxon and Mobil had to merge. And you saw the same thing in agriculture. Commodity prices were going up, so therefore, oh, there must be shortages of corn and wheat. So fence post to fence post, fence post to fence post. Everyone bought land, going up in price, couldn't lose. Agriculture went into depression in the 1980s. Ben Bernanke the other day said, defending himself in a lawsuit about the illegal takeover of AIG, said, oh, we had to take extraordinary measures because this was the worst financial crisis in human history. He's got a short memory. <laughs> the 80s were far worse. It's just this time policymakers were even dumber than they were in the 80s. Yes. yes. <laughs> but, but you had the savings and loan crisis. You had the top banks in this country about to go down as Mexico was going down. Yes. Far worse. In recent years, 500 banks have failed. In the 80s and early 90s, 3,000 failed. So Bernanke, supposed scholar of the Depression, all he learned about was helicopters, throwing money around. But uh, so we, we, we've had worse. And the key, the key thing is, the virus in the computer. You couldn't trust prices. Today, oil's now $100 a barrel. How real is that? How much of that is crisis in the Middle East? How much of that is people speculating? Because they think it may go up nominally even more. You don't know. And so you get capital misdirected, as was in the 70s and early 1980s. Think of it. They say, oh, this Labor Day weekend, gas was the lowest price in four years, $3.40. True, depending on the part of the country you live in. But let's go back a little bit. This kind of undermining doesn't go in a straight line. Twelve years ago, it was a dollar, dollar and a quarter. They don't want you to remember that part of it. In the last 15 years, over a trillion and a half dollars we've spent importing oil that we could have saved if oil still stayed at $20, $25 a barrel. Think of what you could do in your loan lives if you didn't have to spend so much on gasoline. Think of what we could have done with that trillion and a half dollars we spent unnecessarily when we undermine the dollar. Think of the new products and services we'll never see. Think of the cures and medicine that we'll never see in terms of cancers and Alzheimer's and other diseases we need to fight. All those resources wasted that could have been used for a productive purpose to give us a higher standard of living. And so this is not just about economics. When people stop trusting money, they, start, they stop trusting each other. It undermines social cohesion, undermines the moral order. Lenin was right. Not one in a million will understand it when you debauch the currency. Locke was right. Father of our Constitution, Declaration of Independence, John Locke. He said when government arbitrarily changes to the value of money, it cheats people who have entered private contracts with each other. Some may get a gain, some may get a loss, but only everyone loses. You saw it in the housing bubble, which we never would have had if the dollar hadn't been undermined. Bankers get the blame for it. Bankers responded to the virus in the computer. And so with housing, they knocked artificial interest rates low artificially so people borrowed who shouldn't have. They got shafted when the, when the rates went up. Lenders got shafted. They're still paying for it today as the politicians loot banks. So when you have the undermined currency, you make a mockery of prudence, as we see today, mockery of thrift. Steve pointed out, you save, but you don't get a return on your money. Self-control is mocked. Cronyism is rampant. It means I expect, it seems like speculation is the way to get ahead instead of honest effort. Mm -hmm. And look at it this way. In the 40 years that we have been off a gold standard, 
our average growth rate is less than it was the previous 180 years that we are on a gold standard. And remember, that 180 years encompasses world wars, civil war, depression, depressions, Great Depression, forgotten depression of the early 20s, all sorts of human catastrophes. Yet the average growth rate was higher than the last 40 years. If we had maintained gold standard growth rates, do you realize the American economy today would be 50% larger than it is now? Ponder that. Eight trillion dollars bigger. Life would be a lot better. Now we'd still complain. The Yankees would still suck as they did last <laughs> night against the Red Sox. Some, 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 some things don't change. Some things don't change. But there's a reason. There's a reason why people feel that we're not moving ahead. And society turns on itself when it feels that mobility and the opportunity is being corrupted. And they don't understand why. So we have to tell people why this is happening and what we can do about it. And the thing about a gold standard is we did for 180 years. We can discuss the specifics of a new one, but as you all know, we're not talking about using gold coins. If you want to, you want to go to Walmart and use a gold coin, fine. Buy a pair of socks and give them a $1,300 coin. That, that, that'll be very interesting. Go ahead, go ahead. But all of, it's like a ruler. Gold simply says this has a certain value. If you do it right, you don't even have, need to have much to back it up. Just one little statistic. Before World War I, Britain had about 1.5% of the global gold supply and ran the system pretty well. After World War II, because we didn't know what we were doing, we had about 40% of the gold supply, 700 million ounces versus 7 million ounces for the Brits, and we destroyed the system. The key thing is knowing what you're doing. Gold is like a ruler. Just because it is 12 inches in a foot does not restrict the size of a house you may wish to build or a building you may wish to build, just as a unit of measurement. Gold is a measure of value. So the dollar stays fixed as value as you can in human affairs. It doesn't restrict the money supply. As my friend Nathan Lewis pointed out, from 1775 to 1900, when we went to start our quest for independence, American Revolution, small East Coast nation, 125 years later, we're 20 times the population, greatest industrial nation in the world, dollar fixed to gold, amount of gold in that time in the world increased only three and a half fold, yet the dollar money supply increased 160 fold. Why? Because people knew the dollar value was fixed, like 12 inches in a foot, 60 minutes in an hour. So this idea that it's going to put us in deflation, all that kind of thing, nonsense. All it means is there's going to be more honesty. When the government says it's going to stimulate the economy, the resources come from you. They don't come from Mars. And the amazing thing is, why is counterfeiting illegal? Because it's a form of stealing. It's like stealing a claim, making it out of thin air. That's why it's illegal. That's why when you go to a store, you give them a $50 bill, they examine it all sorts of ways. Yeah, when the government does that, prints money, it's called stimulus or quantitative easing <laughs> instead of counterfeiting, which is what it is. You create money in the marketplace, claims on products and services. Government may ratify it, but you the ones who do it. So the bottom line on all of this is, since we have to trade with one another, work with one another, cooperate with one another, money facilitates that. If we don't do that, we stagnate. We don't develop our talents. And we turn on ourselves and on each other, as we've seen time and again in the last century alone. So you gotta get the money right. You get that right, you can commit a lot of other sins and still move ahead. But if you don't get the money right, you can do a lot of other things right, but you're not gonna move ahead. So this is the basis. It's a form of enabling us to work with one another, cooperate with one another, bring out our talents, enable us to take risks, learn from failures, and move ahead. It's the whole essence of the American dream. We undermine money. And by the way, that 50% number, 50% larger, if we'd had growth rates throughout our history that we've had since we went off the gold standard in 1971, our economy today would be one-fourth the size it is now. Imagine taking a 75% cut in the standard of living. The amazing thing is the standard of living improves and we 
sort of take it for granted. But somebody in closing online the other day, Forbes.com, pointed out, if you want to see how the standard of living moves up, look at The Simpsons. Look at the first cartoons that came out 20 years ago. This middle class, lower middle class family, Simpsons. One car, few things in the house. Today, two cars, flat screen TV, not the old TV, handhelds galore. Things get better. And because it's gradual, we don't realize how things get better. But money is essential to doing that. If we don't get that right, then it's all for naught. And these things here will be, like they are today, <coughs> decorations rather than symbols of integrity and a vibrant future. Thank you.